Hi, my name is Chelsea Turner and I'm the Instructional Design Coordinator at South Art Community College. Today we're going to talk about UDL, the Universal Design for Learning. UDL eliminates barriers to learning and maximizes learning for all. When I think about UDL, I think about a course I took in my undergrad that had to do with um, ESL certifications. It was a, it was a class you took that gave you strategies and skills for how to teach English language learners. Um, when we took the course, our instructor was really good about telling us that like, yes, these are skills and strategies that are going to help those students who don't speak English as their primary language. But these are also skills that are really good for m lots of kids in your classroom, whether they can speak English or not. Um, and that's what I think about when I think about UDL. It's it's kind of, I think when people hear about it, they think about accessibility or inclusivity, but it's really good just for everyone. It's strategies and things you're going to keep in mind that are going to help everyone learn better. So, um, what is UDL, right? So first, the U obviously stands for universal, and what we mean by universal is curriculum that can be used and understood by every single student. We're going to skip the D for right now and go to the L, the learning. So um, learning, when we're talking about learning, neuroscience tells us that our brains have three broad networks. The recognition, which is the what of learning, the skills and strategies, that's the how of learning, and the caring and the prioritizing, that's the why of learning. So um, all students, though, and people learn in different ways. So how do we create a curriculum that challenges and engages all types of diverse learners? That's where the design part comes in. Um, when you're thinking about design with curriculum, let's stop and first think about design when it comes to architecture or buildings and um, the example of the wheelchair ramp. So that's designed for people in wheelchairs, but it's not only used by people in wheelchairs, right? Like if your friend comes to visit and they have a stroller and there's steps going up to the building, they can take the ramp instead. Um, if you have, if we're on campus and we're carrying a lot of computers on a cart, we would use the ramp to get into a building instead of taking each item off the cart and pushing those up this or moving those up the stairs. UDL is the same way. So we're designing our curriculum with certain accessibility features in mind, um, but it really benefits other people too. So when you design for people in the margins, you're making things better for everyone. Um, that's a lot though. So how do we do that? How do we design curriculum with this UDL mindset? You first start with a goal. We have made, I've made another video about backwards design, and that's the first part too. I think it's the first step in a lot of things um, when it comes to education. So what is your goal? What do you want students to be able to do when they walk away from your course? Or what do you want them to be able to know when they walk away from your course? So after you've decided that, that's the first step, then you're going to ask yourself, what barriers might interfere with all my different types of students reaching that goal? And that's where UDL comes in. There are three basic principles that um, we use to create flexible paths to learning so that each student can progress. The first one is multiple means of representation. So you want to present your content in multiple formats so that you're reaching students and how they learn. But not just multiple for formats, you wanna also make sure you're providing varied supports. This was something I worked with my teachers in K-12 with a whole lot. We're not asking you to dumb down your curriculum or, or take your content and make it simpler. Um, we want our students to learn at really high levels and we want your expertise to really shine. But to do that, some students need extra support. So you have this goal you want them to get to up there. You just have to scaffold that learning so that they can get there. That's the hardest part. So, um, but keeping the fact that students are going to need supports in mind and that supports may look different for each student. That's the second, or I'm sorry, the first principle in the UDL. Um, the second basic principle of UDL is providing multiple means of action and expression. So you want to give students options to express 
what they know or what they've learned. Let them play to their strengths. Give them choice and student choice is so powerful. It gives students ownership of their learning and of the content they're creating for you. You want to make sure you're providing models, feedback, and support to support all different levels of proficiency. Um, the next one is engagement. I know you're probably sick about hearing about engagement, but it's so important. You want to make sure you're providing multiple means of engagement for your students. What excites one student may not excite the next student. Um, and you're not going to excite every student every lesson, but it's just something you want to keep in mind. Um, when I think about engaging students in learning, something that I think about a lot is um, Howard Gardner's theory of multiple intelligences. It was one of my favorite things to learn about in my undergrad, and as a classroom teacher, it was something I tried to keep in mind as I was planning my curriculum. And sometimes maybe not like m my curriculum in general, but like my day-to-day -day lessons of how I got to that goal I had set, I really tried to keep students' interests in these multiple theory this theory of multiple intelligences in mind as I created those day-to-day -day lessons. I'm going to do a really quick, brief overview of um, some different intelligences that Howard Garner talks about. I'm going to link to an infographic I created and some videos too. So if this feels like a lot, just take a breath and you can um, pause the video, come back to it, take a look at the infographic, however you want to do that. The first one we're going to talk about is the linguistic verbal intelligence. So the linguistic verbal intelligence, um, intelligence, these people are really good at using words well, both when writing and with speaking. These individuals are typically very good at writing stories, memorizing information, and reading. Um, they are good at remembering written and spoken information. They enjoy reading and writing um, for fun. They like debates or to give persuasive speeches. They're able to explain things really well, and they use humor well when telling stories. I read somewhere that your linguistic verbal learners are your typical, like, really good learners. Like, when you're thinking about, an av like, a student that's naturally very good at learning, you're usually hitting those linguistic verbal learners. The next one we're going to talk about is our logical mathematical learners. So people who have high logical mathematical intelligence are good at reasoning, recognizing patterns, and logically analyzing problems. These individuals tend to think conceptually about numbers, relationships, and patterns. Um, these people have excellent problem-solving skills. They enjoy thinking about abstract ideas. Um, they like conducting scientific experiments and solving complex computations. The next one is Howard Garner's theory of bodily kinesthetic intelligence. So these people tend to be good at body movement, performing actions, and physical control. People who are strong in this area tend to have excellent hand-eye coordination and dexterity. They are skilled at dancing and sports. They enjoy creating things with their hands. They have high physical coordination and they remember by doing rather than by hearing or seeing. When I think about bodily kinesthetic learners as a classroom educator, I don't always think about like um, physical sports and dancing. I think about students who need to do things rather than hear or see them. They need to um, get those manipulatives out and touch something because that's how they're learning. So that's, I could be wrong, but that's how I interpret that. The next one is musical intelligence. So people who have a strong musical intelligence are good at thinking in patterns, rhythms, and sounds. They have a strong appreciation for music and are often good at musical composition and performance. They can recognize musical patterns and tones really easily. They remember songs and melodies, and they have a rich understanding of musical structure, rhythm, and notes. The next one is visual spatial intelligence. So these people are really good at visualizing things. Um, they're often good with directions as well as maps, charts, videos, and pictures. Um, they read and write for enjoyment. They're good at putting puzzles together. They interpret pictures, graphs, and charts really well, and they enjoy drawing, painting, and the visual arts. They are also really good at recognizing patterns. 
The next two are really interesting to me, and I'll be honest, as an undergrad student, when we were learning all these educational theories, the next two I would get confused very easily. Um, interpersonal is the one we're going to start with. These are your people people. So they uh, work really well with other people. They're skilled at assessing the emotions and motivations and desires and the intentions of those around them. They communicate very well verbally. They're skilled at nonverbal communication too, and they see situations from different perspectives. Um, they create positive relationships with their peers, and they're good at resolving conflicts in group settings. So your people, people, interpersonal. Intrapersonal learners are those more, um, they like to isolate and self-reflect a whole lot. They're very good at understanding their own emotional states feelings and motivations. They tend to enjoy self-reflection and analysis. Um, they like to explore their relationships with others, but more so assessing their personal strengths and weaknesses within those relationships. Um, they're very, they're excellent at self-awareness and they're uh, good at understanding the basis for their own motivations or feelings. Okay, and the last one is the uh, naturalistic intelligence. So these individuals are really good and in tune with things that are happening in nature. They're often interested in nurturing and exploring the environment around them and learning about other species. These individuals are said to be highly aware of even subtle changes to the environment. People um, with this intelligence are usually interested in subjects such as botany, biology, and zoology. Um, they like to categorize and catalog information, and they enjoy anything outside, camping, gardening, hiking, exploring the outdoors. Um, they dislike learning unfamiliar topics that have no connection to nature. This one might be the hardest one to um, kind of keep in mind as you're designing curriculum because um, not all of our content relates to nature really easily. So if you click this link right here, it takes you to an infographic that I created about all of those different types of intelligence, their characteristics, what they're good at. Um, and then there's a YouTube video where Howard Garner talks about his theory. And then there's a website where I got all of this information from. Um, as we're thinking about the UDL, you might be thinking about Ally. And so if you don't know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about Ally, this video is a great video you can take a look at that just kind of tells you what Ally is and how it integrates with Blackboard. So um, you've probably uploaded images or uh, documents, PDFs into Blackboard in your course, and you might see something that looks kind of like this meter right here telling you your Ally score. Um, when you upload things into Blackboard, Ally is a tool we have for accessibility and it takes your content and it like puts it out to students in multiple formats. So if uh, a student can listen to a document or a PDF instead of reading it, or it might take your uh, document and put it in um, a format where they, it's really easy to read online. Um, there's, there's a lot of really cool features that Ally does. One of my favorites is the Beeline Reader where it like changes the color of the text from line to line so that if you're really tired but you need to read things, it's really easy to read. So there's lots of really great features within Ally. Again, and you don't have to have any kind of issue to use the features of Ally as a student. Um, but it's because Ally takes that content and gives it to students in different formats, we have to be very careful about what we're doing when we're creating our content. If we don't label things a certain way, it's not going to translate very well. I have another video where I walk you through um, a Word document and how it, why it got such a bad score in Ally and how to easily change that where it gets a good score and where it's um, much more easily accessible for our students. So watch that, check that out, and that will help you um, kind of use this great tool we already have in Blackboard that will, it's like the first step in keeping that UDL in mind. So don't forget though, always keep your goal in mind. It doesn't mean to not make your content challenging. We've already talked about this. We want to have challenging contents. We want our students at high levels of learning. The trick is to help them get to that challenging content in a way that they understand. 
that's good teaching. That's what's hard. That's what takes you from a regular teacher to a phenomenal educator. And we want to help you get there. Here in academic support. So don't forget, keep your goal in mind. And universal design for learning is just creating learning opportunities for all. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. You can email me, call my office, text. You know I'm available to help in any way that I can. Thanks.